this is the kind of video I've been wanting to do for a long time. It's going to be a real open box, candid discussion about Aton cameras. And we're going to be discussing the 35.3 3 perf camera, and we're going to be discussing the XTR Prod. Not just because I own these cameras, but also because I really think they're some of the best cameras made. So let's talk about some of the specs because a lot of people forget that you know you you really can't shoot 35 millimeter in such a small package and be very quiet. So the XTR Prod is one of the quietest cameras ever made. It can do about 20 dB in a, you know when it's tuned right and the magazines aren't making any noise and the film's not scritching on the mag. You know there's a lot of things that can make cameras louder. But the movement wise, it can do about 20 dB. The 35.3 in four perf mode is about 32 dB. So it is a much louder camera, 12 dB louder. Um, and you can hear it. You can hear the tick, tick, tick. It sounds like a film camera, you know? You don't really get that with the 16 camera. Uh, in a quiet room, the XTR Prod is pretty silent. You know, you're not gonna really pick it up very much in the microphone. But in a quiet room, the 35.3 is very evident in four perf mode. Now in three perf mode, which there are very few cameras out there that do three perf, but in that mode, it's more like 28 dB, so you can knock off four dB right away. And then there's a blimp that you can put over the camera that's basically a leather bag that helps with the gap right here between the magazine and, and the body. Um, it takes the tick, tick, tick and turns it into just a kind of a rumble. And so you don't really lower the dB very much, but it goes from sounding like a film camera to sounding like just a, a machine that's running in the background. And I think that helps a lot. I really do. I think that the blimp, when you put it on, you knock the dB down maybe one or two at most. It's a very minor, minor, minor knockdown. So let's just say it knocks it down to 26 dB, unscientifically, okay? Um, but that difference helps the camera go from being very much an MOS camera in four perf mode with no blimp to in three perf mode with a blimp being about the same amount of sound as like an SR, you know? Um, and that's pretty amazing to, to me, you know? And yes, there's more accoutrement you have to put on the camera to make that all happen. Um, but still, the point is, is that the camera can be quieted down and used for sync sound as a three perf camera with that blimp. And I've used it. I have some friends who have the same camera. They've used it for sync sound stuff as well. It does work. Um, it's not designed to do that. It's still an MOS camera, but it can be used for it because it's on that cusp. Airy doesn't make anything like this. You know, Airy, uh, the 235 is very loud. The 435 is very loud. Um, they don't make anything that's this size that's designed for this kind of hybrid use where you can use it for sync sound, but it's kind of an MOS camera. And it's really unfortunate because this movement design is so easy to do. It's, it always shocks me that Airy never went this direction with their cameras. Um, weight wise, the XGR Prod 16 pounds and the 35.3 is 18 pounds. However, the film weighs a lot more. So, you know, as much as it's nice to say, oh, they're similar in weight, they really aren't. When you put film in it, the, the 35.3 is a lot heavier of a camera. It's a lot heavier. I, I shoot with both cameras a lot and I usually use prime lenses in the 35.3 and a zoom lens in the Super 16 camera and the zoom lens is a heavier lens than the primes, but the whole package is way lighter. Um, I'm not actually sure how much this whole thing weighs kitted out, but we've done some shoots recently with it completely kitted out and it was really heavy. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not gonna exaggerate, it's very, very heavy. So this is a four and a foot roll of 16 millimeter. This is a four and a foot roll of 35 millimeter. These cameras only take four and a foot rolls right now. Uh, unfortunately, they never made a thousand foot mag for the 35.3 and Kodak doesn't make any larger film anymore for the XTR Prod than four and a feet. Though there was a 800 foot mag and a 1200 foot mag available for this camera at one point. So let's talk about building a 35 millimeter version of a 16 millimeter camera. So the first thing obviously is that 35 millimeter film because it's so wide, your gate has to be a lot wider, which means the front of the camera has to be a lot wider. The mirror shutter has to be larger as well because a smaller mirror shutter won't cover the full gate. 
So as a consequence, your front of the camera and how deep it is has to be very, very different than a 16 camera. So when you look at the 35.3, one of the things that you notice right away is that the 35.3 has a very more has a very different profile to the front of it. The the XDR Prods profile kind of has this little bit of a hook on it. 35.3 has a much longer hook to it because the mirror shutter goes down a lot further because it's a much bigger mirror. The other thing when you look at the front of the two cameras is that the 35.3 is clearly a much wider camera. Now, funny enough, there's another big problem, which is the 16 millimeter mag is what's called a coaxial magazine. It loads film from one side to the other side. And as a consequence, they can make the magazine kind of short, but the magazine's actually about 35 millimeters wide. Now, of course, you can't make a coaxial magazine for 35 millimeter and have it 35 millimeters wide. It doesn't work. So how do you make a magazine the same size as a 16 millimeter magazine, uh, but hold 35 millimeter film? And what he came up with was, I think, an industry first, and it is called a displacement magazine. The 35.3, with this displacement magazine design, really only holds about 600 feet of film. In fact, it only holds a little bit less than that, actually, about 500 some change. What happens is that the film, as it expands, as it runs, it pushes onto a roller, and then it moves across. The 35.3 is actually an extremely clever way of dealing with this huge problem, which is how do you fit four and a foot into a small magazine without having to make the camera huge. The magazines in the 35.3 and the XTR Prod are almost the same size, actually. And if you look at them, you can see very clearly that they are very, very similar in size. Um, I remember when I first got the 35.3, the pictures didn't do it justice. The size comparisons are so similar. In fact, the biggest difference between the two magazines is that the XTR Prod magazine has this cutout in it, which is where your shoulder goes. And the 35.3 really doesn't have that cutout. That's really the only difference between the two magazines. But the magazines are very different inside. Everybody knows the XTR Prod magazine is one of the easiest magazines to load on the market. The 35.3 magazine is one of the most difficult magazines to load on the market. And the reason why is because to make it the size and to make it a displacement magazine, they had to do some very clever engineering. And the way they developed it for this camera versus the Penelope is really not as good as it could have been. The Penelope, the camera that came after the 35.3, has a much better magazine. It's a displacement magazine as well, but it's a bigger magazine. It's physically a larger mag. It's lighter weight, but it's bigger. So the 35.3 has the smallest 35 millimeter displacement magazine you can get. It's even smaller than the Aricam magazines. It's very, very small. And considering the fact that all the movement is inside the magazine, and all you do is take the magazine and push it onto the camera to run it, it's pretty amazing. The electronic parts of the 35.3 mag are pretty cool. So the neat thing is, is that unlike the XTR Prod mag, which is basically all mechanical run by the camera, the 35.3 mag does have a mechanical drive right here that runs it. However, it has a lot of electronics inside. One of the cool features is that it has a switch down here that tells you if the loop um, gets too small for some reason. So that helps the operator not damage the film or make the camera loud all of a sudden. It'll say in the side of the camera, loop. Um, the other thing it has is that if the take up stops spinning for some reason, it'll tell you that it has a scratch. And that just means the take up stops running. Um, the counter on the side of the camera is kind of a clunky thing. It has these uh, pickups in the side here that hook to the camera and these, these electronic pickups also don't work very well. So it takes a little bit of time to get it working. You gotta clean the contacts, you gotta replace those super caps and then the things work fine. But loading it's more tricky. Because Aton's known for their 16 cameras, they basically adapted the VSA um, video tap and built it into one housing for the 35.3. Um, on the XTR prods, the camera modules here and the electronics are here, but on the 35.3, it's all one big module with everything included. Um, they did make a VSA for the 35.3, but I have a VHR, which is the last generation tap they ever made. It was an upgrade to the 35.3 uh, that was the same tap as the Penelope. The VHR for the um, XTR Prod is actually included in the Xterra, which is the next model up from the XTR Prod. And there were kits available for XTR Prods to convert them to that tap. But what it does is it replaces this electronic section here and this electronic section here with a big bracket that comes out the side, takes two batteries.
Both cameras' menu systems work exactly the same. They're literally just the same exact thing, hybrids of one another. Uh, they both have the little knobs that you turn that allow you to adjust the different settings on the menu. Um, they both can run uh, multiple frame rates. The 35.3 is limited to 40 frames a second, but the XDR Prod 75 frames a second. Variable rates, again, infinitely variable from three frames a second all the way up to 40 on this and all the way up to 75 on this. Um, the viewfinders are exactly the same, which is kind of a funny thing. The XTR Prod has a ground glass that's all in one casing that comes out with the tool. The 35.3's ground glass comes out with a piece of tape. You just put a piece of tape on it and it slides right out. It's just one little piece of glass. They both have the same kind of handle and they both have tools in the back. Um, the XTR Prod has a ground glass tool and it has the shutter adjustment tool. It goes from 180 degrees to 144. The 35.3 has a shutter tool as well, same angle shutter, but it also has a pitch control tool. Um, 35 millimeter film was perfed slightly different between brands. So if you bought Agfa or uh, Fuji film versus Kodak, you would have to adjust the pitch. But nowadays, all, all films Kodak, it's the same perforation machine, so the pitch is pretty much locked, but it has a pitch adjustment. 16 millimeter has pitch adjustment too, by the way. It's just that it's internal and it's kind of a pain in the ass to do. It's not something that can be done very easily. This thing can run and you can make adjustments to the pitch while it's running. It's pretty cool. The 35.3 is driven by two motors. One moves the movement and the sprockets. The other one drives just the take up. The XTR Prod is all driven by one motor right here. And that motor has a shaft that comes up and drives the sprocket drive and the take up side on the magazine. And that's why there's a belt in the magazine that goes from <clears throat> the drive system where the sprockets are to the pickup. On 35.3, they have a belt as well. And the reason why is because that whole assembly slides back and forward. So they had to have a single location for the drive motor. And then they had to have a belt so that when it swings over to load more film on to the take up side, uh, it needed to have a belt there to do that driving. So the XTR Pro is a direct drive camera. And what that means is that the single motor drives a shaft that moves the pull down claw directly and also moves the shutter. And so they're both in sync together all the time, which is really nice. The 30 by three is not a direct drive camera. And what that means is that the motor drives the pull down directly, but the mirrored shutter is actually driven by a belt. It's a very complicated way they did it. And I think the reason why they did what they did is because they didn't have enough room to have a long shaft to run a direct drive um, like the XTR Prod for the shutter. And so they used a belt. And part of the other thing about using a belt is that if you use a belt, you can get rid of some sound. Um, when you're running something like a shutter at high speeds and it's big and heavy like this, you want as much damping as possible. So you can use a belt to drive a shutter instead and you can have the shutter on some more and it basically helps dampen some of that sound. But with the 35.3, there's nothing like it. You know, Eclair had the Camflex, there's a Russian copy of the Camflex. They are loud, super loud cameras. There's the Airy, um, you know, 2C and the Airy 3. All right, cut. And there's the 235 as well. These are all MOS cameras. When you turn them on, they go rah, they make tons of noise. There is no making them not make noise. You gotta put them in a box three times the size of the camera to quiet them down. This camera was so close to being a quiet sync sound camera that they just decided to make it a quiet sync sound camera as close as they could and then the three perf makes it quieter and the blimp makes it quieter and eventually you can kind of get it to where it is good enough. Yeah, it was when I was a soulless little robot with too many ideas. The uh, Penelope, the model that came after this, is quieter. It's actually really a sync sound camera. It's definitely a quieter camera. To me, when I look at the battle between 16 and 35, like I talked about in my other video, I think that 16 millimeter wins the battle by such a fair margin, it's kind of silly to even own a 35 millimeter camera. And the only camera that I would ever own would be something lightweight and small so that it, I have the feeling that I'm shooting 16 and that's why I have one of these and that's why this is such a cool camera because it is like shooting 16. A lot of people shoot 16 and they want that gritty image. 
I don't like that gritty image. I want a nice, tight, fine grain image. And that's why I like 35 because it gives me that. I like shooting with high ISO. I like pushing my stocks a stop. Uh, you know, getting a thousand ISO out of 500 stock and, and really pushing the format. And you can do that with 35 in a way you can't do with 16 at all. So it's, to me, that's the benefit of 35, but it's an expensive format. I think that if I were to do a big movie where I had plenty of money um, and it was, you know, make a decision, are you going to use your cameras or somebody else's cameras I would rent? Um, I think having the 35.3 is less of an enabler than having a 16 camera. And that is exactly when my digital cinema camera stopped working. It has been corrupting cards recently, and I, of course, never checked it, thinking that it captured everything, and of course it didn't. So thanks for watching this video, even though the wrap-up is basically non-existent, and I will see you next time.